So we're talking about Joseph's life. We're talking about Joseph who had, who had a dream and how he saw that dream come into fulfillment. Um, so wh why are we calling it a napkin dream? Uh, we're calling it a napkin dream because um, we're asking this question. If somebody gave you a napkin and asked you to write down your dream on, on a piece of paper, on a napkin, a paper napkin, uh, what would you write? Would you be able to write something there? Or um, would you be able to draw something there? That's the, that's the idea behind, uh, behind this, this title called Napkin Dream. Um, I understand, when we started this series, we gave you, all of you, a blank napkin, and I said, you need to keep this. Um, just in case, if you have a dream, start writing it down there, or draw it there, so that, uh, you know, throughout this journey of learning from Joseph's life, uh, we, get to, we get to see how we can see what God placed in our heart to come into fulfillment. But some of you are saying, well, I don't have a dream. Uh, I mean, I wish I had a dream. I don't have a dream for my life. Um, it's okay, blank napkin is a good place to start. So this series will ask God to give you a dream. Ask God, you yourself ask God, God place a dream in my heart for my life, that you want to do something through my life. And who knows, by the end of this series, you may actually have a napkin dream in your hand. And that's the goal of this series. We've been talking each week about uh, what lessons we can learn from Joseph's life. And we talked last week, one, one lesson, and this week we're going to do our second lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Here's the big idea for today. The greatest job ever is to be a servant. The greatest job ever is to be a servant. Well, that, that doesn't sound awesome, isn't it? I thought, I, I'm going to be great in my life. I thought, um, you know, um, at, when we are talking about dreams, I thought I'm going to become somebody awesome. Um, but the step doesn't look like that. The greatest job ever is to become a servant. When I started thinking about this, um, we, we, I was reading an article, I think in um, Forbes, if I'm not wrong, which did a survey among all those who had jobs, you know, a wide number of people across the world, and um, um, you know, talking about their perception of their jobs, the jobs that they're in right now, or the things that they're doing. Uh, um, so they asked the opinions about their jobs, opinions, you know, asked them, how do they feel about their job and things like that. Uh, and here is the most interesting, 90% of them, those who have jobs, that includes you and me, 90% uh, of those who had their jobs, had three things in common. It's very interesting, huh? number one. That nobody, not everybody, liked their job. 70% of uh, you know, the people interviewed across the world, it's not just a one country problem, across the world, 70% of them said, um, we don't like our job. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Almost every single person said, I'm glad I have a job. I don't like my job, but at least I got a job. Yeah. And then uh, the third thing, the most common thing among all these people is this. Nobody thought that their job is part of a dream. Nobody thought that their job is part of a dream. Uh, something that is bigger than themselves. They didn't think about that. I don't think Joseph would have seen his life in Egypt as something that is part of a bigger dream, a dream of God. In the grand scheme of things, that, that's, that role that he's going to play in Egypt is, is going to make a difference. He doesn't know that. It could be possible that you may be in the same place right now. That it is really tough for you to accept that my job in Hyderabad is not really part of the grand scheme of things. See, one of the toughest things is to see how God uses our jobs, the jobs that you are placed in right now, to, to, to get in our lives, to get us ready to do what He wants us to do in the future. His work. Could it be possible that your job today that you have in this, in this city is one of the steps that God is putting you on in order for you to accomplish your dream? Think about that. If you can understand that question, then what I'm about to say in the next half hour is going to make sense to you and is going to really make an impact in your life. Genesis chapter 39. Let's go there. 
uh, we, we read Genesis chapter 37 last week we, and, and the week before and we started looking at Joseph's life. Now we jump to Ch- Genesis chapter 39 uh, and continue Joseph's life. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by Ishmaelite traders, last week we saw him being picked up from the pit and he was sold to Ishmaelite riders, um, traders. Um, and th- this is what's happening. They, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He made him uh, in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and the property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, except what kind of food to eat. So let me just take two steps back and get you, know, get, get you up, updated on the, on, on the series. So um, we started Joseph's life uh, with him having two dreams. Dream number one, he had a dream that along with his brothers, he was in the field harvesting the wheat. While he, well, they're gathering these, uh, you know, these sheaves together, uh, his bundle was standing straight and his brother's bundle started bowing down. Eleven of his brothers who were elder to him, all their wheat bundles started bowing down to him. In his dream, uh, as he woke up from this dream, he realized that oh, God is telling me that I'm going to be great. Maybe he thought he's going to become great because he saw what's, what was happening in his dream. So he goes to his brothers and tells them, um, did you know I had a dream and in my dream, you, I'm going to be awesome. They got really mad. Then the next day he's got another dream after some time. He's got another dream. In this dream, he was the son. Son, not S-O-N, S-U-N. He was the son. And then uh, you know, uh, around him were moon and all 11 stars bowing down to him, he thought, maybe all of these are bowing down to me, um, because, uh, you know, including my parents. Uh, So he thought, I'm going to be somebody great. It partly is true, he's going to be great. I'm going to be awesome. Maybe I'm going to do something great in my life. Uh, So he goes and he tells his brothers, this time they get more furious, they decide that, given a chance, we're going to kill this fellow. Uh, That's how mad they became. On the top of it, his father gave him a robe that kind of proved his point, you know, to them, to his brothers. And, so, and the worst part is Joseph wore this robe everywhere he went. Uh, every time they saw Joseph, their anger kept increasing. Because Joseph kept not only thinking that he was somebody, he was beginning to act like he was somebody. And he was uh, thinking that everything he does is the right um, because he believed that I'm going to do something great or I, I, I will become great. And, uh, and the, the robe kind of got into his head. That's why last week I taught you step number one, lose your robe. Lose your robe, keep the dream. You see, you have to lose your robe, the robe which you've been uh, you know, wearing and walking around. Uh, walking around, in order to get the dream, you got to leave that, lose that robe. Your robe represents the pride. Pride will rob you of your dream. Pride will get in the way of your dream. We all have a tendency to wear something, a sort of a robe upon us in an effort to disguise our weaknesses, our pain. We wear success, we wear perception, we wear a career or family or religion or, or, or self-righteousness for that. Uh, uh, you know, even pity for sometimes, you, you know, in order to cover up what is really happening. And pride is one of them. Pride will get in the way of your dream. Here is how pride will get in the way of dream, your dream. Pride will push, your, push people away from you. Nobody likes people with pride. You see, if you are wondering why you don't have constant friends in your life, could it be possible that your attitude is so stinky that they don't want to be around you? 
Could it be possible that your pride is pushing people away? And that's why there is no constant friends in your life? Pride pushes people away. Number two, pride leads you into a pit. You don't see that coming. Everybody sees that coming in your life. When Joseph went to check on his brothers at Dotan, Joseph was happy with himself. He was wearing his robe and he thought he's going to be awesome. He's going to be great. He's going to watch all his brothers at work and get a report on them and take it back to his father. Joseph was coming from afar. His brothers saw him from afar, started making plans to kill him and put him into the pit. Joseph doesn't know that he's walking straight to a pit. He doesn't know that. People with pride can't see the pit. Pride leads you directly into your pit, your fall. Number three, pride robs you of what you value most. Joseph's value was on his robe. He thought his worth is his robe. Uh, what was, whatever he was wearing, he thought that was, that, you know, that represented his value. And that was the one thing that, uh, that got robbed off, uh, you know, robbed off from him. The first thing that they did is rip off his robe. If given a chance, that's what people will do to you if you are a person with pride. Rip off the one thing that you value the most. Here is the worst part. This is the last one. Pride splits families. Pride splits families. That's why marriages crumble. That's why families, ego-driven mindsets destroy relationships. If, between, uh, I'm taking marriage as an example because that's the closest relationship that you can have here on earth. If two people who are supposed to live their life together, ordained by God for entire lifetime, if they don't check their ego outside of their home, they're going to have struggle in marriage. Pride splits families, remember that. So that's what happened. Joseph's brothers stripped him off his beautiful robe, threw him into a pit. They wanted to kill him, but the elder one came and said, no, no, don't do that. You know, he's, anyway, he's our little brother. Um, just spare him. And so he, his plan was, when nobody's seeing, he can rescue him and take him back to his father. He's got his own reasons. Reuben got his own reason. <laughs> I told you about that reason last week. He's got that reason for him, you know, to redeem himself of what he has done before to his father. So... Mm, Reuben was planning that, but the Joseph's brothers just simply planned that if we can't kill him, we've got to do something so horrible that all his life he will struggle. And that's what they did. They saw Ishmaelites coming from afar, and they thought, you know, what better way to take revenge than to sell him as a slave to them? The one person, one group of people in this whole world that hate us, Ishmaelites. Let's just sell him off to them. He's going to be, I mean, all his life, he's going to be treated so worse. It's better than killing him. So that's what they did. Sold him to Ishmaelites. Um, so we learned a lesson. Lose the robe. Lose the robe. Keep the dream. Lose the robe before you get sold to Ishmaelites traders. And today, here's the second step number two. Um, if I have to become great, I have to start as a servant. That's a very important thing. You need to start serving today, wherever God placed you. Why? Because um, there's a benefit in servanthood. And I want to show you four benefits of servanthood. Joseph's life. Just looking at Joseph's life itself. Number one, servanthood reveals my true identity. Servant heart reveals my true identity. Servanthood, servant heart, however you want to write it down. You see, I want you to remember this. Your identity comes from God, not from what you do. Let's go back to Joseph. Chapter 39, verses 1 and 2. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was uh, uh, the captain of the, of the guard of um, God for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Um, the Lord was with Joseph. So, he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. As he got sold into slavery and then got sold to Potiphar, the captain, guard of, um, captain of the guard of uh, um, 
Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, it's, it's really struck me um, and in, as an interesting point. Look at the person to whom he got sold, Potiphar. Who is this guy? This guy is one of the most influential people in that country. Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who is the most powerful man on the earth at that point of time, um, had this group of people who were serving under him, taking care of every administrative aspect of his country, his kingdom, his empire. And Potiphar is one of the topmost officials just under Pharaoh. Joseph gets to be a slave to that guy. It's really interesting because I'm going to come back to that point in the second one, uh, second benefit, but let me just make this. God knows where to position you at what time. The position that you're thinking today, that you th that's, not, that, that's beneath me, that is the place you need to be today. There's a benefit in that, I'll show you that. Every place that God places, He positions us exactly at a place where He can then use our lives, through our lives, do something great. You are going to do something great for God, I want you to know that. Let me, let, let me tell you this, but in order to do something for, great for God, you got to become a servant. The Lord was with Joseph, did you see that? He, everything Joseph did, he succeeded. In that, God began to give a success to him. In that, even small job, what could Joseph be doing in Potiphar's house? This guy is a stranger uh, in a foreign country. He has no language background, he has no culture background, so he basically is coming from, you know, nomadic life into a civilization. So, you know, he, he has no, absolutely no idea of how, how you know, how to behave himself, how, how to dress, uh, how, you know, how to be, you know, talk, uh, none, none of it. He, even if he wants to talk in a proper way, he doesn't know the language. That's, the, that's his problem, right? He's completely thrown into, uh, he's thrown into a completely new world in Egypt. What job could he get? Tell me that. You know, you see a lot of people in, in our city, right? Uh, the cheap labor that comes in, into our city, uh, or any city for that matter, the migration happens from rural parts of other states. And as they come in, they can't get bigger jobs because they can't speak the language. They, they, you know, they can't fit into this. The only jobs that they get is the most menial jobs. And I can give a guarantee Joseph started there. Down, bottom, at the bottom. But that's how God works. A God is a great God who has a great dream, wants to do great things through our life, but he will only do that by helping you to start at the bottom. That thing never really gets into our heads, you know, as Christians. Even disciples who were following Jesus for quite some time didn't, get, uh, didn't really understand that mindset of God. One day Jesus was walking back from Capernaum. In fact, he was going to his cross, actually. He was coming to Jerusalem to die now. Two and a half, three and a half years, they, began, they followed Jesus. They saw what Jesus did. They uh, experienced the, the, the power of God firsthand. They witnessed it. They heard every single word that Jesus spoke um, while he was on the earth. They, they followed him day and night. And while they are on the way back up and home to Jerusalem, the one thing that they are fighting over was with, about who is the greatest among all of them. Peter fighting with Simon, Simon fighting with, uh, with James, James fighting with John. You know, everybody is talking about, hey, I'm the closest guy to Jesus. I'm the biggest guy. I'm, I'm, you know, that, that's what they've been discussing all through the journey. Because Jesus, knowing what they're talking about, uh, kept quiet all the way. You know, at some point, they're going to stop talking about it, right? They didn't. So when they reached closer to Jerusalem, two brothers, James and John, who are, you know, called the sons of fire, they actually came uh, because they are, the, they are the guys who, you know, who are the mouthpiece among all of them. They want to ask this question. So they came and said, Jesus, who's the greatest among us? I want to be great. 
Jesus uh, probably had that, that moment where he said, Kitna bolu yaar ek long ko. You guys never get it, do you? You never get it. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. Officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, it will be different. This is God's opinion about how to be great in our lives. Listen to that. He's saying this. Whoever wants to be a leader, a great person, among you must be your, what? Servant. That's the place you begin. You want to be great? Start as a servant. Whoever wants to be the first among you must be your slave. Now, I know the words look really, oh, that's those two big words, servant and slave, you know, and it kind of, really, you really want me to go and start cleaning up toilets or what? Is that what you're asking me to do? Sometimes we tend to misunderstand what Jesus was saying there. So let me just take a moment to explain that. When Jesus, when, of course, the, the, the words are translated as servant and slave, what Jesus was trying to teach is a heart. He's not... When he says, think of yourself as a servant, he's not asking you to become a pushover by everybody. That, you know, you're, you're letting everybody to play football with you. That's not what Jesus is asking you to do. You know, sometimes we get to miss those, 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 those ideas, those, th that point. Whoever wants to be great among you must become, must become, the servant. We focus on the servant part. Did you know he already gave permission to become somebody else later, before? What did he say? Whoever wants you to be, whoever among you wants to be, what? Great. A leader. So basically, Jesus is giving you permission to be great. We don't, we always miss that point. You want to be great? Start as a servant. He's not asking you not to be great. He's not asking you not to be a leader. He's not asking you not to be, a, not to be the first guy. You know, the number one. He wants you to be. He wants you to be great in your work. He wants you to be the number one in everything that you do. You know, you are so excellent in what you do. You, people respect you for who you are. He wants you to go there. But in order to go there, you've got to have a heart. A heart of service. A heart. When Jesus says a servant heart, this is what Jesus is saying. You've got to have a heart that is selfless. That you're not thinking about yourself all the time. You're not thinking about your fame, your luxury, your properties. You're thinking about how do I use my influence to become a blessing to others. That's selflessness. In fact, I'm going to close the entire sermon with that, that idea. But let me just you know, talk about God's view of servanthood is this, I become selfless. That's the way to become great. The moment you start thinking about yourself as a servant, servant of whom? Servant of God. The moment you start thinking yourself as a servant of God, it changes everything. I don't know about girls, but when guys meet for the first time, this is how usually the conversation goes. Let's say if I'm meeting Prasad, and I'm going to say, hey, I'm Chaitanya, and I'm a leader, a pastor. When he's going to introduce back to me, I expect him to say, I'm Prasad, and I am so-and-so. This is what I realized, that guys, I don't know about ladies, I don't know how you introduce yourself among I don't have the insight there, so I'm just... <laughs> I realize this. We tend to find our identity in what we do. That's why if I lose a job, I lose everything. That's why people, when they lost a job, they feel rejected, they feel they lost their identity. I'm nobody, you know, that's what we feel. Because we find our identity in what we do, what you need to do instead of that is that you find your identity by whom you're serving. 
That's why I said you are a servant of God. You see, you are a servant of God. Even if you don't agree with that, you are a servant of God. Every single one of you is a servant of God. Wherever you are placed, whatever job you do, you are a businessman, a firefighter, I don't know if there is a firefighter, you are a cricket player, you are a doctor, you are a, um, you are a CEO, you are a police officer, you are, you are a soldier, whatever job you do, that's not your identity. Your identity is you are a servant of God. The moment you have, you have accepted Jesus into your personal life, you have now become a servant of God. You know, when we tend to think servant of God is the one who stands here and preaches. I want to change that theology. I want you to understand that that's not how God sees us. Every one of you is a servant of God. Bible calls you royal priesthood. I love the way Pritam ended his testimony and said, Capstone will always be in my heart and I'll be a capstone in Germany. So in Berlin, we can expect a capstone now. You're a servant of God. No matter what you do, you're a servant of God. Um, the way Solomon introduces himself, I, I'm always fascinated by the way he introduces himself in his book, Ecclesiastes, as he writes, he says, I, Solomon, the servant of God. I, Solomon, the teacher, the son of David, and the king of Israel. What's his job, actually? What's his job? King of Israel. But he puts it in the third position. His first thing is this, I, Solomon, a servant of God. That's number one. I want you to know, every one of you, your identity is not by what you do. Your identity comes by who you serve. You are a servant of God. The moment you understand that, everything changes about you. Everything. How you look at your job, however menial it is, or however high it is, it really doesn't matter anymore now for you, does it? Because you, you, serve, a, you serve a totally different, you, have, you are in a totally different realm now, right now. You serve a different boss for a different purpose. That's probably why Paul told us, in everything that you do, do it as if you're serving the Lord, not people. That's number one. See, here is what happens. The moment you have allowed that servant heart to come into, you, you know, um, to um, uh, understand, come to understanding of that servant heart and begin to recognize that you are a servant of God and you're serving God, then everything that you do starts becoming successful. Everything that you touch would start turning into gold and people notice that. People begin to see that. This fellow, whatever he does, he does it so good. And he makes it successful. That's what happened. Potiphar realized, that's what the Bible says, eh? it's the most fascinating verses, verse for me in that chapter. Potiphar realized that the Lord was with Joseph. How does Potiphar know who the Lord is? Who the Lord of Joseph is? Potiphar comes from a different culture, different religion. He has a different God. He doesn't believe in what Joseph believes in. How does Potiphar know that the Lord is with Joseph? Think about it. And that's the, that's the point I want to talk, uh, push to in, in, in number two, is this. Servanthood redefines, if you can understand that, servanthood redefines my success.
could success be you are good at serving could your promotion be so that you can serve more people and serve them better maybe you need to understand what success looks like from the eyes of god and success is this for him you serve well number 3 Servanthood is good because servanthood reshapes you into a blessing. Servanthood reshapes you into a blessing. Meaning this, that you actually get to become a blessing to others just by being a servant-hearted person. From the day, verses 5 now. We have finished fourth verse, now look at verse 5. You know, you know verses 2, verses 2, 3, 4, 5, six all of them almost look like repetitions of the same thing but at a different level so you need to understand those those differences okay versus fine from that day joseph was put in charge of his master's household and the property he was before what was he personal assistant remember that okay he was a personal assistant taking taking care of the home now because god was giving success to him in there Potiphar promotes him more, and now from that day, Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property. The Lord began to bless. Now, here is the very important observation that you need to make. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. Joseph is still the servant. Joseph still doesn't have a car. Joseph still doesn't have a home. Joseph still is going in metro. Listen to this. Joseph is doing excellent job, but he's not getting bonuses. Who is getting the blessing? Tell me, you don't like this part. Tell me, who's, who's, who's getting the blessing? Potiphar. It's funny, isn't it? Joseph is the guy who's working hard. Joseph is the guy who's most ethical. Joseph is the guy who's following every rule. His boss is getting blessing. I've realized this. That that's the way God makes us great. Not by blessing us. By blessing somebody else because of us. Does it make sense now? Potiphar is the guy who's becoming richer every day. Whatever is the guy who's experiencing all the blessing because of Joseph. You know, if you are Joseph, it, it could be really depressing to you, you know. <laughs> Last two years, I'm the guy who's struggling here. Uh, you know, you, you should be grateful. At least give me a job or give me a home or give me a car as a gift. You are the one who's buying one car after the other, one home after the other. And I'm the guy who's logging here, doing all your business. You see... That's what servanthood is. That you serve your pati for well. Even though you are not the one who's getting the blessing. We don't like pati first. But I think God teaches us servanthood by teaching us to serve our pati first well. I don't know who is your pati for today, here, right now in Hyderabad. You better serve him well. You better make him rich. Even though you're not the guy who's getting blessed in the process, he's the guy who's getting everything. Because of your hard work, you still do that. That's servanthood. Does it make sense? You don't like that part, right? Not at all. But there is a benefit because of that. You see, when you begin to bless others, people will stand up and begin to notice that. Potiphar begins to notice that. Potiphar begins to see Joseph as somebody uh, who genuinely wants to bless him. When God spoke to Abraham and gave him a promise that I will bless you, I'll make you into a great nation, I'll bless you, and through you, all the families of the earth, not just your family, but all the families of this earth. Did you see that? That's how God works. He blesses you so that you can then become blessing to somebody else. Sometimes he blesses others through you without actually blessing you. 
But that itself is a blessing. That's my point. You see, I've realized this. Blessing people is more powerful than converting people. Did you know that? As Christians, we're always taught to think in that angle. Whatever we do, our hidden agenda is how can we convert this person? I think because of that, we fail largely. I don't know if any pastor has told you that. But it's true. Our mindset is that how can I do something good so that he can change and become Christian? It's a wrong mindset. When you begin to genuinely begin to bless people, because you want to bless them, they begin to see that the Lord is with you. Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph. How did he know that? He realized that this guy who's serving me, he's serving me genuinely even though there is no benefit to him. He's serving me genuinely so that I can become blessed. I can be rich. I can, I can have all that I need. I, I can see this guy is a trustworthy person. Then whoever he believes in must be really God. I think there's a lack of leaders, Christians like that in this world right now. The moment we change that mindset to, a, you know, to, to, to become somebody who chooses to become a blessing to Potiphar's, we then begin to see um, that people stand up and begin to take notice of who your God is. That's the whole dream, you know, behind the dream center. The, the only reason we want to build a dream center is, you know, I don't want a facility for a church. Elementary is good enough. We, we always wanted to build a facility that we, we get to use it on a Sunday. But throughout the week, Dream Center is going to be a place where we train people, whether they are Christians or not Christians. Whether they will come to our church or don't come to our church. It doesn't matter to us. That we genuinely become Christians who are using our skills to bless somebody else in order for them to accomplish their dreams. When the world begins to see that, then we begin to change people. So what you're going to invest into as a, as a church, as Capstonians, into Dream Center is worth it. Every single penny of it is worth it. Because you're changing lives. Not building a building, you're changing lives. You're changing the future of our country. Do you know why we started this church? Have you ever, have I, have you ever if you have ever listened to my story, you would know this. The only reason I, I don't want to get out of high-tech city is because of this. You know, there are other cheaper places that we can actually have a service. But I don't want to, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here. It's because of this. That 12 years ago, 13 years ago in Dubai, God spoke to me. When I looked at the condition of uh, Indians serving there as menial labor, the kind of pathetic situation that they are in, and I, I, it broke my heart. And I said, I mean, if my country is better, my people don't have to serve like that. And I know there is only one way to change our country. It is this, that we inf infiltrate this system, this country, with leaders who have right ethics, good, right heart. You know? And I know the word of God will teach that, to have the right heart, right principles in their head, right principles in their heart. They are driven by the word of God. And people who are equipped with word of God and stand in powerful positions, they start changing the system. I know it may not happen in my lifetime. And I'm okay with that. But I get to start the process. When I go to heaven, and I'm sure one day there will be people uh, who will come and meet me and say, you have absolutely no idea what Capstone did. I'll be like, please tell me the story. Dream Center is that. We become a blessing to others, genuinely, Without the intentions of converting them, people will begin to experience Christ powerfully. Does it make sense to you? If you don't like, you don't have to come back next Sunday, by the way. But that's true. Number four. 
Servanthood increases my influence. Servanthood increases my influence. That's number four. He, remember this. Great servant always gains greater influence. Great servant always gains greater influence. Look at the next verse. It's almost like a repetition of verses five, but from a totally different angle. Look at this. So Potiphar now, he was the, he was a personal assistant. He was then taking care of his, he's become a house manager. Now look at him. Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything, everything, not just the house, not just the, um, you know, the land around the house, but now anything Potiphar ever owned, any place in Egypt or any other place across that empire, Potiphar now gave all the administrative response. He's basically become the CEO. Where did he start? As a toilet cleaner. Where did he end up now? As a CEO of the entire company. That he didn't, with Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except for what kind of food to eat. He must be a really Hyderabadi, you know. <laughs> and without biryani, I can't survive. <laughs> so he would have said, Joseph, don't make any decisions about my food, boss. I'm going to eat biryani. Whatever gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything. So well, become best thing, you will gain influence. When you genuinely begin to bless your Potiphar, you'll start gaining your influence. You have to, here is the point. And I think um, in, in Christendom, this is a problem. Uh, in church, I come from a church background, right? So I come from a pastor's home. Uh, so I get to watch what happens in local church. I get to watch what happens in a denominational level. Um, and I've realized this, a lot of young potential leaders, potential superstars, you know, who would have done a fantastic work for God, couldn't do what they could have done with their lives because of this, because they missed this principle. Listen to this. You have to learn to be under authority in order to be qualified to serve in authority. If you don't learn to be under authority, you never get promoted to be in authority. That's just not God's way of working. God's way of teaching you how to be a person of authority is to teach you by putting you under authority. Does it make sense? I think that's where a lot of pastors miss. That's where a lot of churches struggle. Uh, I don't know how it applies to your business world right now at this point in time. But you better learn to serve well under authority. Then you would become a person of authority. I think that's what leadership is all about. And John Maxwell defined it as a leader, as a person of influence. Plain and simple, influence. But the, the point is this. Influence doesn't come because of your position. Because a position can be taken away from you anytime. But influence comes when you serve well. How? Let me just, how do you gain greater influence? How do I know I have influence? One word, trust. When people start trusting you, you have influence over their lives. Does it make sense? When your patipar starts trusting you, you are in a position of influence. When your Potiphar is saying, well, take care of the company. I'm going to Tahiti for a holiday. He basically told you, I trust you. Just do whatever you want. I trust you. What a position to be in huh, as a Christian. Think about it. Isn't it the lack of those kind of Christian leaders um, that we still have what is happening in our country, the corruption, uh, you know, the inequality, injustice. We always throw blames on our governments and who is on the power. I actually think we should be the people who should be blamed. That we have never lived up to the kind of expectation God has for us. To be leaders of great influence. To be people who raise the bar of their influence by, by, by being 
genuinely interested in the country that they are in uh, to become a blessing to that country. Could it be possible that because we didn't do that, that we never had influence? Just think about it. You're going to, if you have to gain trust, trust will take time. That's as simple as that. And the more trust you gain, the more. 